it's really good to have you join us here today. So welcome. Uh, my name is Natalie Criddle and I am the youth worker at Gold Hill. And my name is Shona Hunter-Singh. I am the children's and families worker at Gold Hill. And we are really excited that you are able to join us this morning. I don't know how you've ended up on the Gold Hill Easter service. Maybe you're a regular attender at Gold Hill. Maybe you picked up one of our painter pot packs. Maybe you've popped in for some prayer this week. You are so welcome here. Here at Gold Hill, we believe in community and we love to celebrate together with people of all ages. So here today, we've got a celebration service for everyone. So we're so glad you could join us. And it may be, just maybe some of the little ones or younger ones, you might find it tricky to sit still for such a long time. So maybe you wanna grab some Lego. Maybe you wanna build the Easter story as you're joining in this morning. Maybe you want to be writing things down or drawing pictures or playing with Play-Doh or doing some coloring in sheets. Do whatever you need to do in order to help you connect with God and hear the Easter story this morning. As we start our service today, I'm just gonna pray on this Easter Sunday. Jesus, I thank you that we can celebrate Easter Sunday together. God, I thank you that from looking back from Palm Sunday last week through to Good Friday and celebrating you rising from the dead today, thank you that there's so much joy. Jesus, I pray that you would be with us um, wherever we are today as we watch and engage with this service. Amen. Amen. So I think we've been sat down too long now uh, and I think what better way to start off a celebration and a party than a game. Are you ready? I'm ready. Three, two, one. It is time for our game and for this game you are going to want to get your Strava on, you're going to want to get your Fitbits on, you're going to want to be counting those steps because we are going to do a little bit of exercise today for our big game to get our blood pumping ready for the rest of the video. Now you may have heard of the bean game. Have you heard of the bean game where we've got the French bean, ooh la la, where we've got the running bean, where we've got the jumping bean? Well, we are going to put an Easter, Easter twist on our game and we are going to do the egg game okay as you can see i am a fried egg so what you need to be doing is you need to be walking around your living room wherever you are watching this maybe you're watching it outside i don't know want to be walking around okay and if i say fried egg i need you to do a star jump for me okay Oh, gonna get my hair in my face. I need you to do a star jump for me. So let me see. Pretend you're walking, you're walking, you're walking. Fried egg! Okay, a few of you are a bit slow, but don't worry, don't worry. The game has not started yet. Now, if I say poached egg, a bit fancy, a poached egg, what we need to do is go like this, as if you're going underwater, because poached eggs are cooked in water. Poached eggs. We've got our fried egg. Okay, getting better. We've got our poached egg. And now our scrambled egg. What you need to do is run really, really fast on the spot. Scrambled egg. Can you do it? You ready? Scrambled egg. Good work. Okay, so we've got our fried egg. We've got our poached egg. We've got our scrambled egg. And we want to have a hard boiled egg. So this is our hard boiled egg. So if I say hard boiled egg, I need you to make a hard boiled egg shape. So, are you ready for the egg game? Okay, let's start. You're gonna start walking around, you ready? Three, two, one, go. Okay, walking, walking, walking. Fried egg! Okay, if you didn't quite get it, you're out, but that was a practice, don't worry. So let's go again. Scrambled egg! Better. Keep walking. Poached egg. Good work. Some of you forgot it there, but that's okay. That's okay. Fried egg. 
Nice, nice, nice. If your grown-ups aren't doing this, by the way, you need to scram them up, get them involved. Hot ball deck! Nice, nice. I'm gonna walk around in a circle, I think. Frantic! Scrub deck! Poach deck! Hey, I'm quick. Kind of because I know it's coming, but. Easter egg! Hey, didn't have one for that, did we? If you did something, then you are out. Keep going. Walk around, walk forwards, walk backwards, turn around. Scrub it! Nice. Hot ball deck! Good work. Fry deck! Ha ha ha, have you copied me? Did that one wrong on purpose? Keep it going, a few more. Get those steps up. No, Friday's my favourite, I think. Poached egg! Ooh. Poached egg! Hard boiled egg! Nice. Scrambled egg! Good work, good work. Okay, one more. <sighs> what should we do? job all the eggs you guys did an excellent job well we hope that you had a chance to join in with that game with us and we hope um, that you just had a bit of fun with it yeah absolutely we are going to move into a time of song worship now it may be the first time that you hear the songs that we are going to sing this morning but maybe you just want to enjoy them listen to them listen to the words read the words as we have this time of worship together. Now, if you are under four years old, or you have a sibling that is under four years old, then in their painter pop pack, they would have got one of these wonderful egg shakers. And you can use that in your worship this morning too. So we're gonna pass over to the band now.
Podcast. We hope that that was really good time for you and whether you're used to singing along with our online services or you are new here today we really hope that that time of worship of singing wherever we are um, to God was good and filled with joy for you too. We're going to pass over to Stephen who's going to be speaking to us this morning he's going to open up the word he's going to share a bit of the Easter story with us so over to you Stephen. Happy Easter, everyone. Depending on how far through the day you are before you're watching this service, you may now have um, some empty Easter egg boxes like this one. Um, Maybe you have empty boxes, but a full stomach. Um, I've got this empty bag here, and I just want to use it for a moment to help us think about how God uses empty to create full. Because Jesus' grave was empty on that first Easter Sunday when Jesus' Jesus' friends went to visit his body. Their hearts were empty and they were hurting with grief. And maybe even the promises that Jesus had said to them, the things that he had taught them, maybe they felt empty because he had died. So maybe they wouldn't come to pass anymore. Those promises wouldn't come to pass. Empty, just like this bag. But God is in the business of, of... doing miracles and uh, he loves to move in the opposite uh, the opposite direction to our reality so what they perceived as empty was actually full each promise that Jesus had given they thought may be empty now but actually each promise uh, because Jesus was alive was going to be fulfilled the empty grave um, the, like my empty bag, the empty grave that first Easter meant that actually the lives wouldn't be empty, but actually they could be, because Jesus was alive, they could also be fully alive. An empty grave meant they could be fully alive. And those empty hearts, just like this empty bag, um, that their empty hearts, um, because Jesus was alive, that their empty hearts could be made full of joy once again. And that empty grave turned an empty heart to a heart full of joy. Now, let's read this passage uh, and unpack it in more detail and how God uses empty to create full and fullness of life. We're reading from John chapter 20, verse 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, um, the one that Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still didn't understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me. 
for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God's. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Let's just take a moment and recognise the enormity of what we've just read. Mary and the disciples who are hurting so much and, and deeply grieving, such sadness and broken heartedness at watching their friends on, on, on Good Friday, uh, their leader, um, Jesus, their Lord, um, they watched him be killed. And now to make that worse, it appears that someone has taken the body, an empty grave. And all that grief and, and distress would have been amplified. And then in a moment, suddenly the, the whole situation flips and, and from grief and disbelief, suddenly the reality dawns that Jesus is alive, incomprehensible, miraculous, life-changing, earth-shattering reality. This is a, a, a well-known, it's a significant passage, so familiar, and we can so quickly read through it. Well, we know that story. But pause for a moment. Try to, to begin to grasp the depth of joy, the emotions involved, the elation that they must have suddenly encountered. This is the best gift ever, the pain of grief shattered in a moment and more than that life in all its fullness possible the promise that that Jesus had, had said and given in um, that we read in John 10 verse 10 that, that life in all its fullness becomes a living reality I want us to take a, a, a quick look at Mary and at John and at Peter and see how as these three friends of Jesus, th these three followers of Jesus, as they discovered the empty tomb, that as they saw that the em uh, Jesus' tomb was empty, their hearts could be, um, could be filled and their lives could be filled with a deeper, more beautiful, more incredible life than they had ever known. The, the life that Jesus had promised, life in abundance, an empty tomb, just like this empty bag, flipped to create a fulfilled life. Let's think about Mary first. Mary Magdalene, um, Magdalene isn't her surname or family name, she was just simply from a city called Magdala that uh, was uh, and, and the ruins still are on the um, northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee in Israel. She had become a follower of Jesus after uh, Jesus had released her from being plagued by seven demons. We can read of that in Luke chapter 8. Now this poor lady had an awful existence that, um, that must have been so dark and damaging and isolating, seven demons plaguing her. And then she meets Jesus and he changes everything. She's released and she literally walks into a life that is full of light and joy. Imagine what a gift that would have been to her. And now, whilst it's still dark, she visits the grave of Jesus. And we can see that her heart is so heavy after seeing Jesus die. The joy has gone. He changed her world and, and she was devoted to him. But that empty feeling of heartbreak and grief is, is there in the place of the joy that she once felt. She sees the stone has been rolled away and she runs to tell the disciples and she returns but is still feeling broken, empty and really confused. And then through her sobbing, she peers into the tomb once more. And this time sees two angels sat where Jesus' body would have been. And they speak to her and, and then what she thinks is a gardener appears. She's so desperate to know um, where the body of her life-changing Lord has been placed. She just wants to be close to him, to honour him. We hear that Jesus simply says her name. Mary. And in that moment she realises she's heard that voice before. She recognises that voice and suddenly her grief 
because of the empty tomb, it is replaced with joy. She's filled up with joy. He's not missing. And more, more than not, not just missing, Jesus is alive. Her joy is restored, pure joy poured back into her. The emptiness that she was feeling is gone. The brokenness that she was feeling goes. The confusion that she was feeling is all replaced with joy. And she hugs him and doesn't want to let go. Mary discovered that Jesus' grave being empty meant that her life could be filled with joy once again. Let's now think about John and Peter, the other two that ran to the empty tomb that Easter Sunday morning. John is the disciple who had the special bond with Jesus. He's, he's the one that wrote the Gospel of John, um, his account of the life of, of, and ministry uh, of Jesus. And when um, John first met Jesus, he and his brother James had the nickname Sons of Thunder, maybe because um, he was quite an angry person or he was quick to judge other people. There's a, a, uh, an example of this um, in Luke 9 where John offers to call down fire on, from heaven to get rid of people who aren't listening to Jesus. Son of Thunder, that's a good example. However, John, the son of thunder, after being with Jesus, is changed from being um, known for thunder to being known for love. John loved Jesus and he knew the deep love that Jesus had for him. He even says that um, it, in, in, verse, in verse 2, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. He knew that love that Jesus had for him. What caused John to run to the tomb that day? I think it was love. Love caused him to run, caused him to hope. Could Jesus be alive again? So he ran and he ran really fast. He says twice that basically he won the race against Peter. And he looks in the tomb and we read these words in verse 8. He saw and believed. He didn't understand how. He didn't understand why Jesus rose, but he still believed that this empty grave meant that Jesus was fully alive again. Because Jesus was alive, John knew that nothing could stop Jesus' love. Nothing could stop Jesus' love. Death couldn't stop it. A stone tomb couldn't stop it. The Roman dictatorship at the time couldn't stop it. Jesus' love wins against all things. And the love of Jesus changed John from a son of thunder to a disciple of love. And John could be fully alive, full of Jesus' love. And then there's Peter. Peter was so close to Jesus. But when the challenge came as Jesus was on trial, he lied to the people around him and said that he didn't know Jesus. He must have felt so broken inside to have been so disloyal out of fear. How could he be the person that Jesus had, had said that he would build his church on? He was ashamed, probably broken hearted, not just from losing his friend, teacher and Lord, but even more so because he disowned him. Was it his desire to say sorry to Jesus and to be forgiven that caused him to run that day? To be told by Jesus, I can still use you. My purposes for you are still real. They're still true. What I've said to you before is still true. Was it that desire, that hope that he could have a fresh start with his friend? Was it that that caused him to run that day? A new beginning, starting over with Jesus. Was it the reality dawning that all the promises that Jesus had spoken about, starting over with Jesus? And Peter ran. Peter ran straight into the tomb and he saw it empty. And that empty tomb, those discarded grave clothes, meant that Peter could hope again. And we read later on that Jesus and Peter walked and talked together. And Peter's hope for a fresh start became a reality after meeting with the risen Jesus. 
Peter's hope-filled life because of Jesus being alive, that empty grave, Jesus being alive, his, uh, Peter's life became filled with, with hope and that caused him to become known as the Apostle of Hope. And about 30 years later, Peter wrote a letter to Christians around Europe and Asia, which we can read in 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter 1 verse, verse 3, we read, Let us thank the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was through his loving kindness that we were born again to a new life and have a hope that never dies. This hope is ours because Jesus was raised from the dead. Peter knew that the empty grave gave him fullness of life. It, it meant that um, Jesus' promises to him, what it, Jesus had said to him, could be fulfilled. And his promise to use Peter as a leader in his church was once again possible, even though he had messed up. Three people visited the empty grave and discovered that Jesus was alive. Three people discovered that the empty grave of Jesus means that their lives can be filled with joy that they could be filled with hope and, and fully alive because Jesus is alive. And that every promise that God has given will be fulfilled because Jesus is alive. It was true then and it is true today. These three lives were changed then totally transformed and Jesus is still in the, the, the business, in the work of changing lives. He's still doing it now, transforming lives, filling people with joy, bringing people fully alive and fulfilling his promises to, um, to them. I wonder today whether you are empty and are in need of going to that empty grave and seeing that Jesus is alive and being filled with joy once again or restarting or starting for the first time the life that Jesus meant for you a life in all its fullness and knowing that every promise of God through Jesus and the, the power of the life that he brings the life that he offers is a yes and amen. It, it, it's a promise fulfilled through Jesus. Can I encourage you, even if you've been a Christian for years, to return to that empty grave and experience that God uses empty to turn it to fullness of life, fullness of joy and his promises fulfilled. And I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight it was my tune Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my tune Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And now 
your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I made you. sin was heavy, but chains break out the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, and I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. Your glorious day. Thank you, Stephen, for sharing with us this morning. Isn't it awesome to hear stories about how people's lives were changed as a result of the resurrection? And we just sung that song, Glorious Day, about how we find life in Jesus, how we come running out of that grave because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. So the Easter story was about 2,000 years ago, and you may be sitting there thinking, that is a long time ago. But we are gonna hand over to the lovely Fiona, who has a great story of how Jesus has changed her life. So over to you, Fiona. Hello, I'm Fiona Castle and this is my story. If anybody asked me if I was a Christian, I would say I'd been a Christian all my life because as a child I always went to church. It was a very important part of my life. I just kneel down and say my prayers in the evening and so on. And then I went to an Anglo-Catholic boarding school where there was very strong emphasis on religion. So it was all very important to me to be part of what was going on but there wasn't a reality there. And the reality didn't happen till much, much later after I was married and I was 35 years old. By that time, I was happily married uh, to Roy Castle and uh, he was a successful entertainer. And I had four lovely, healthy children, a beautiful home with everything in it to make life comfortable. You would have thought I was the most happy person in the world, but unfortunately I wasn't. And that wasn't because I was, wasn't grateful for all I had, it was because I felt that I was rubbish. I looked around at my friends and they all seemed to be doing things so well and I tried so hard to do everything right because I always wanted uh, Roy to be pleased that he'd chosen me as a wife and I wanted to do everything right but it didn't seem to work for me. Why didn't it work for me? It worked for other people, they all seemed to get on with everything really well. And I tried and tried to do everything right and kept failing. And one day, in utter desperation, after I'd taken the children to school, I went up to my bedroom, got down on my knees, and I just cried out to God. And I said, God, if you're there, you've got to help me. And you've got to help me now, because I've had it. I cannot go on any longer. It was as simple as that, but I meant it. 
I hadn't even got up off my knees after that short prayer before the phone rang. I went to answer the phone and the person who was at the other end was a woman I'd met a couple of times. I, I, I wouldn't have called her a friend, um, but I did know she was a Christian and she just said, Fiona, I don't know why I'm phoning you, but I've had you on my mind recently and I had this sudden urge to ring you. She said, I feel as if you need to talk. Would you like to come round and have a coffee with me and we'll, we can talk? Well, I recognised that as God's amazing way of answering that desperate cry for help. So I went round to her house then and there. I dropped Benjamin, who was our baby, who was about a year old, into Roy's arms and said, I'm going out. And he thought that was it for good. I literally left him holding the baby. But off I went. And I met up with this lovely lady. And she was a very good listener and she heard me out. And then she asked me the most challenging question I've ever been asked in my life. She said, you know, Fiona, you think you're a Christian because you go to church, but have you ever invited Jesus to come in and take over your life? I said, no, I hadn't. Didn't realize you were supposed to. As I said, I always tried to tick all the boxes to make people think I was good. She said, well, don't you think it's about time you did? And so I said, yes. So with her help, I invited Jesus into my life. She told me that she had suffered from depression for many years as well and that taking that step had totally transformed her life and I thought, well, if it's worked for her, it could work for me, I'll give it a try. And with her help, I prayed a very simple prayer which was something like, please Jesus, forgive me for the mess I've made of my life up to now. I recognize the way I've tried to run it hasn't worked. So you come in and take it over and see what you can do with the rest of it, okay? That's how simple it was. I didn't know what to expect, but it was as if peace just fell all over me and right through me, touching all the different parts of my body and all my different needs. And I just knew that something amazing had happened. I went home that day to face the same problem, the same family, the same situations I'd faced before. It wasn't that my circumstances changed, but my attitude to all those circumstances changed. In fact, even on the way home, as I was driving home, I felt the Lord saying, don't tell Roy what's happened. Live out what you've discovered. So I was very quiet and I got on with my life. And I think Roy was very surprised that I was nice and friendly and happy again. But he didn't say a word for about a month. And then he said, where did you go that day? And what's happened to you? And why are you being nice to me? And suddenly I realized that Roy had understood what had happened. So when I told him, he said, oh, thank goodness. He said, I've been praying for years that you'd see the light and become a reasonable human being again. Our lives changed as a result of that experience. Our marriage changed, our family changed. And Jesus became the most important thing that had ever happened to me and 46 years on it's still the same. You could have said all those years ago that I was but now that's my story but there are lots of other stories.
I wonder what your story is. We are gonna have a time of communion now. Jesus, before he died, gathered with his friends, he gathered with the disciples, and they had a special meal together. He took a loaf of bread and he broke it in half, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. And he had a cup which was filled with wine, and he said, this is my blood, given for you. And we eat the bread and drink wine or juice if you're under 18 today to remember Jesus and what he did for us. The kids from Kids Church are going to lead us in a song called Walk With You. And this is a really, really special song. It goes through the whole story of the gospel. It explains to us how God made a way to him through Jesus. So as you take communion now, be reflecting and listening to those words. You made a perfect world in love, made a special place for us, a place where we could live together. turned and walked away from the perfect plan you made for us to walk with you forever and there was nothing we could do to make our own way back to to the world that you had made You lift us to our feet and lead the way Thank you for your love Thank you for your grace Through Jesus we can walk with you again You made a perfect world in love made a special place for us a place where we could live together
Well, thank you for joining us today. It has been great to celebrate this Easter Sunday together online. Whether you have a story that you've been thinking about during that reflective time or whether you have got a beginning bit to your story, we would love to see you sharing your story with other people. Maybe you want to get creative um, on social media this weekend to share what Jesus has done in your life with others. Maybe you're sat watching here today and you're thinking, I have only just started this um, beginning bit of my story of learning more about Jesus and we would love to continue that conversation with you. I don't know whether you'd want to drop me an email but my email address is natalie.criddle at goldhill.org. I would love to hear your beginning bit of your story and continue that conversation with you. And you can also drop us a message on our social media platforms on Facebook or via the church website. We would really love to hear from you. Now, we have another thing for you this morning, but first, I'm just gonna pray for us as we close today. Dear God, thank you that we are able to celebrate Jesus. We thank you for everything that you did on the cross for us. We thank you that our lives are changed because of what you have done for us. God, we pray that you give us the boldness to share our stories to share how you have transformed our lives. God, we love you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. So we have a treat for you. The Accord Community Choir have put together a song which has been produced and edited by St. Peter's Loudwater and that is going to close our service this morning. Oh, 
Above.